Good afternoon. Um, today we're going to be tying another new pattern. It's in our series of uh, uh, patterns for beginner fly tires. And uh, our pattern that we've selected today is the gold ribbed hare's ear. Now, the gold ribbed hare's ear has been around for probably close to a century. Its exact origin is not, not clearly defined, but it appears that it was uh, developed um, as a sequel to the gold ribbed hare's ear wet fly, um, which would have been developed uh, probably uh, in the 1800s. Now, the gold ribbed hare's ear does not particularly represent any uh, particular species of mayfly, and so we refer to it as a generic pattern, and we also refer to it as a searching pattern. In other words, a searching pattern is a pattern which is highly successful in many places. And so it's a good way of, of identifying that there are fish in a particular part of the stream or river where you're fishing. And so if you have success with something like the, this type of searching pattern, you might continue using that, or you might refine your, your choice of flies and go uh, with something that's close to the gold ribs hairs here and see whether you're catching more fish with that than you did with your original searching pattern. Now, the gold rib hairs here has a, the basic structure of most all mayfly nymphs, and that is it has a tail, it has an abdomen, it has a thorax, and it'll have a head. And uh, in this particular case, we are going to represent those various parts of this, uh, this particular nymph. The, the pattern that I'm going to teach in this session is the basic gold ribbed hare's ear. And we're gonna do two variations of that. If you were to look on the internet for um, various ways to tie the gold ribbed hare's ear, you will see that some fly tires will add other particular types of accessories as I refer to them to the basic pattern. Some will put on uh, uh, rubber legs, uh, some will put on a gold, a, a bead in the front, um, others will put in what we call a hot spot, which is something that probably triggers the fish's response to the fly. Um, I will be showing you a couple of those variations as I, as I go on here. Um, the, but I, I first of all want to go over the materials that will be used and that you will have in, in your package. And so starting with the um, actual uh, rear end of the fly, so to speak, we're going to be using uh, pheasant tail fibers, meaning the small barbules that uh, are sticking off of the stem of, of the pheasant tail. We're going to be using this for both the tail of the fly as well as the wing case um, for the one variation. The wing case in the other variation is going to be this material called thin skin, which has paper backing on it. And you peel that off after you have cut a thin strip, which I will explain. The other types of things that can be used for the wing case of something like the gold ribbed hare's ear is actually a piece of turkey feather. Now the ribbing in the fly is going to be some gold wire and the dubbing that's going to be used for the abdomen and for the thorax. In this particular case, I have chosen this from Nature Spirit. It's referred to as hair's mask dubbing. Some of this dubbing will have, it'll be very coarse because we always use coarse types of dubbing when we're tying either uh, nymphs or wet flies and use the fine material dubbing only for dry flies. Now, before I go much further, I wanna show you where the term comes from. This is commonly referred to as the hare's ear mask. 
and it comes from a rabbit. And the fibers of dubbing are taken from this portion of the mask of the rabbit. If we use that material to tie the fly, it is somewhat difficult. But nonetheless, I will show you what product you get. This one I tied with material from this hair's mask. It is going to look very much the same as one tied with the dubbing that I'm giving, I'm, we'll be sending to you. Now we're going to get set up um, in order to tie this fly in the two manners that I've already discussed. So we have pinched uh, the barb down on the, the nymph hook and I wanted to pause for a minute and point out that we are using this uh, Sabre uh, nymph hook uh, in size 12. And if you were to order it from the Sabre uh, company, it would be their number 7031. So now that the um, hook is in the, in the vise, <clears throat> the next thing that I'm going to do is start the thread <clears throat> um, just slightly behind the eye of the hook and wrap it back to mid shank. and clip it off there. And then I'm going to take a section of uh, lead wire, and this is actually lead free wire, um, and I've matched the diameter of <clears throat> this lead wire to approximately the diameter of the hook shank. And I will begin by at mid shank and I'll begin to make one, two, three, four, five, six, about seven wraps. And then using what we commonly refer to as the helicoptering method, I'm going to break that off so I have a clean break right at the head of the fly. And then push that material forward. And then I can do the same thing at the rear of the fly. Now, immediately behind this wire, I'm going to create a thread bump. And that thread bump is basically reinforcing <clears throat> the lead wire and supporting it from sliding backwards. But just to be, and it's also tapering the abdomen as we will be developing it. But I'm gonna make a few wraps forward over the lead wire. And you see I have a small piece there that I need to take out. wrapping over that to reinforce it. <clears throat> and then returning my thread back to this point at the rear end of the lead wrap. At this point, um, I'm going to continue to wrap this, tapering down the shank of the hook towards the tail until I get approximately above the barb of the hook. And then we'll take a section of the tail, pheasant tail fibers, approximately, uh, probably uh, eight to 10 fibers. And, and I'll clip those out. Line them up. <clears throat> and lay them right on top of the hook to make to measure about <clears throat> just slightly more than a quarter of an inch beyond where the thread is hanging. I'll hold that in place using a pinch wrap to secure it. And it should end up right on top of the, the hook. And then I will wrap this thread forward <clears throat> 
just slightly going beyond where the um, the lead starts. And the next thing I'm going to do <clears throat> is take a section of gold wire. And of course, those of you who are signing up for this class <clears throat> will receive all of these materials um, very shortly in the mail. I lay the gold wire on the side of the hook opposite from myself. And I begin to wrap over it. And I wrap back towards the bend of the hook, holding the wire on the side opposite from where I am sitting until I get to the point where I originally sec secured in the pheasant tail fibers. And I stop at that point. I advance the thread maybe one or two wraps forward, and I'll explain why in just a second. Now, the material that we're going to use for dubbing today, I've already mentioned. It's the uh, Hair's Ear Mask Dubbing from Nature Spirit. And there are a number of other companies that supply this kind of thing in different colors. And I will show a couple of those. Hook and Hackle, for example, um, has a somewhat darker version of this. Here's your material. And a company named uh, Jack's Here's Ear Blend uh, makes it in a, a lighter color. If we're to look at the variations in colors of these different dubbings, you might get an understanding of why some of these patterns they'll refer to as a light hair's ear, uh, gold ribbed ear, hair's ear, or dark gold ribbed hair's ear nymph. So it's your choice, and I would say that uh, most likely you should try to match the color of the dubbing of your nymph with the color of the bottom of the stream because um, these, uh, these insects in a nymph form uh, basically um, will uh, be occurring in the same uh, color range as the bottom of the stream because it, it does uh, um, allow them to hide away from their predators. So, to return to the dubbing process, what I'm going to do is use the uh, uh, method that I've described uh, in our last uh, fly tying session, where I take some of the dubbing in my left hand I pull off a small amount after moistening my finger and I twist it onto the thread in one direction to create a noodle. Now this does not have to be tied on no uh, uh, very tightly, but it does need to be secured at both ends. I then slide this slightly forward on the thread and make several wraps towards the bend of the hook which is going to be where the dubbing is the thinnest. And then I begin to wrap forward. And we want this to be tapered, um, rather robust or rotund right in about mid shank. And I'm going to take this slightly forward past the, um, the middle of the, the hook. Right about, right about there. Pull off the extra. Make a few wraps. Now, if you notice, our, our gold wire is still protruding from the rear of the hook. Now I'm going to make counter wraps, meaning wrapping towards me or the opposite direction from the way that you put on thread and dubbing to segment the body. And you'll make about two or maybe three turns with the gold wire. As I mentioned before, it segments the, the abdomen, but it also reinforces that dubbing uh, to keep the, the teeth of the fish from sort of tearing your fly apart. I bring it one wrap to where the thread is now hanging, make two wraps of thread over the piece of gold wire, move the gold wire slightly to the rear and make two wraps in front. And then I can clip off 
that excess gold wire. Even though I could use the helicoptering method as I did with lead, the lead breaks much easier. I prefer to use fine uh, wire snips, which I'll do in this particular case to cut off that excess gold wire. Now, in this first version of the gold ribbed hair's ear, we're using the butt part of these pheasant tail fibers as our wing case. And so in order to do that, I'm going to first lift that fiber material up towards the rear of the fly and make several wraps of thread immediately in front of it. And that will hold that up out of the way. There may be times in which you um, have advanced your fly, the tying of your fly to this point where you have the tail complete and the abdomen which is ribbed and you're now ready to put in the thorax. And you may decide, I'm not sure that I have enough pheasant tail material um, here to be used for the wing case. So this is, a, this is an ideal time for you to uh, clip out another section of, of uh, pheasant tail fibers, advance your thread to the front of the hook and secure down some additional fibers of the pheasant tail material. And then bring your thread back to about mid shank. And now you can proceed to add more dubbing. Again, I'm going to dub the thread. And note, note once more, I am adding that dubbing in one direction as I spin it onto the thread. And now I begin to build up that abdomen so that it is, uh, I'm sorry, the thorax so that it is much bulkier than the abdomen. Oh. At this point, my thread is immediately behind the eye of the hook. And I'm going to bring this material forward that comprises the wing case. Holding it down with my left thumb, I make one slight wrap around and pull down straight to secure it on top. Several other wraps, <clears throat> lift it up, make a couple wraps underneath that to secure it and clip off this excess material. I can then whip finish the head or if you're not familiar with or don't feel comfortable with whip finishing, you can use your half hitch tool at this point. But with a bulky head like this, whip finisher is indeed um, advantageous. So now that I've completed the whip finish, I can clip that off. Now, the fly still doesn't quite have the silhouette that I want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a tool that I made some years ago, um, but it's, uh, it's not my invention. And basically this is the barrel from a ballpoint pen, which I flattened with a pair of pliers, and on one end, I glued some Velcro. And on the other end, I glued a piece of felt. If I'm going to um, expand the fibers on a nymph, such as the gold ribbed hairs here, I'm going to use the end that has the Velcro on because it's just the right amount of sort of brush capability to be able to tease out some of those fibers from the deers, uh, from the gold ribbed from the hair's ear uh, itself. This makes the fly look much buggier, so to speak. Now there are several ways to augment the wing case, although this is realistic. 
And one of those options, uh, as you'll notice, I have not used any head cement. Um, there's nothing wrong with using some head, head cement, but uh, in, in using something like this fingernail polish that has um, some sparkles in it, silver sparkles, and I think you can probably, in any, you know, sort of drugstore or, or other uh, uh, store where they sell uh, women's cosmetics, you can get some rather uh, uh, inexpensive head cement. And this has sparkle in it, so I can take a little, uh, one drop of this, put on the very top of the fly, and it's going to do two things. It's going to not only reinforce that wing case, but it's going to put a little bit of sparkle into that fly. So there we have it. Um, the one version that we're going to tie today of the gold ribbed hair's ear, and I'll put it in my snip here and uh, let you see it in profile. Okay. Now, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> gold uh, the uh, hair's ear material comes in a variety of materials. So I have tied that fly um, in some, some of the different colors of dubbing. Um, here's the same fly with a darker uh, dubbing, tied the same way. And um, here is one tied with basically that darker material, but I put a, a bead head on this. Um, as well as this has the different type of wing case in it. So my point here is that um, there are a number of different materials that you can use to, to improvise. Um, as long as you follow the same sequence, uh, then your fly is going to basically turn out to be a gold ribbed hair's ear, but it's going to be uh, your modification or it's going to be consistent with some of the standard patterns. So. We will now uh, proceed to using some of the other materials to tie uh, another one of these uh, gold ribbed hair's ears. For this second fly, this second gold ribbed hair's ear, we're basically going to be using the same materials with one exception, and that is instead of having the wing case made out of the pheasant tail, it's going to be made out of a material called thin skin, which I described a little bit earlier. This comes in a sheet, it comes in various colors, and this particular color that I've chosen um, is referred to as mottled olive brown, mottled olive brown. And this will be the material that those of you who signed up for this class will receive uh, enough material for you to tie uh, perhaps uh, two flies using this as your um, wing casing. <clears throat> so I will again put the, uh, the hook in the, in the vise. I've already pinched down the, the uh, barb on it. <clears throat> I'm going to start the thread again immediately behind the eye of the hook, wrap it back to about mid shank or just a little beyond, <clears throat> clip off the excess thread, and wrap the lead wire <clears throat> around the shank of the hook as, it, as I did with the first fly, <clears throat> starting right where the thread is hanging, wrap it forward, until you're approximately uh, one wrap behind the eye of the hook. Use your pliers if you care not to uh, dull, not dull your good tying scissors, but you can use pliers to just helicopter that off. Push it forward so it compacts it, <clears throat> and then do the same at the rear, which I could either helicopter or clip off with my clipper. Build up a foundation right behind that as it did in the first fly. 
And then a few wraps over the lead wire to again, hold it in place. And I'm sort of structuring a sloped portion of the abdomen and then wrapping the thread to the rear as we did before. As you can see, the steps that I've done so far are exactly the same as what we had before. I'm going to take another section of the pheasant tail, which will be used for the tail, but not for the wing case. Clip it out. Measure so it extends again about um, a quarter of an inch beyond the bend of the hook. And then using a pinch wrap, I'm going to secure that right to the top of the, the hook and then hold it in place while I wrap it forward until I'm about mid shank again. At this point, the process is going to change because we're going to clip off that excess and no longer you need it and no longer be able to uh, or want to use it for the uh, wing case. But I'm going to tie in the gold wire again at the opposite side of the hook and wrap it back to the bend towards the bend just about above the barb of the hook. Make one or two wraps forward and the reason I do that is so that when I put the dubbing onto the thread I have space to wrap back to the bend before the dubbing is actually applied. If you try to put the dubbing on back at the bend of the hook, you're going to end up with a big clump right at the very beginning, and you don't want that. It needs to be tapered just as the abdomen of a nymph is tapered. So again, I take um, a small portion of the hairs you're dubbing, twist it onto the thread, Add a little bit more towards the middle of that section of dubbing. And then sort of tighten it up at the very end nearest me. And take about one wrap towards the rear and then begin to come forward. I'm going to apply a little bit more dubbing. And I'm stopping again just about at mid shank. Now some people, uh, some tires will put a half hitch in at this point um, just to secure what they've done so far. So just for the heck of it, I'm going to do that, just one wrap, and then I can basically pull my thread out of the way while I'm wrapping the gold wire around the thorax. Oh, I'm sorry, around the abdomen. So I'm going to make approximately three turns, one, two, three turns of wire. Then I'll make two wraps with the thread behind that. And two in front of it. And then clip off that excess gold wire. Now, the next thing that I'm going to do before I tie in this wing case is bring the thread forward, but I'm laying down sort of a, a level base of thread as I go forward. And I stop not quite behind the eye, 
in order to put in my piece of wing casing. Now, the next thing we are going to do is we're going to put in that wing case. I've selected this piece that is approximately maybe a little bit more than an eighth of an inch wide, just slightly wider than the shank of the hook as it is dubbed at this point. This material has a white backing on it that needs to be peeled away. So I'm going to use my thumbnail or something sharp to kind of break that material the backing away from it and as you'll be able to see here um, I have begun to remove that backing material so I can peel that off and the next thing I'm going to do is cut a sort of a clip and a portion of that material off on each side so that I have almost an arrow point. Turn it upside down so that the shiny side is down at this point, this being the shiny side, this being the dull side. So the shiny side is down. I hold it in place with my thumb and begin to make my thread wraps over that material to secure it right on the very top of the hook. And I wrap this back almost to the point where the gold wire stopped, or about halfway or mid shank. I can lift this forward a little bit so it stands up. And now I'm going to dub the thread again to build up the thorax. Now that the thread is dubbed, I begin to add that dubbing in, into the thorax area. And I, need, I think that I need just a little bit more. Okay. Now I push this wing case forward as I did before with the pheasant tail, holding it down with my thumb, make one wrap around and begin to tighten it down, and then several other wraps. So you should get sort of a triangular shaped wing case there. Once I've made several wraps on top of the the uh, thin skin, I can lift this up, exposing the eye of the hook, make a few wraps in front of that, and clip off this excess material. There's one other thing that I, one of many things that I, but one thing I wanted to discuss about the use of your fly tying tools. Um, a proficient fly tire will never put his or her uh, scissors down because not only do you go, have to go searching for it at certain times because it might be under some of your other material, but you can, you can keep control. And if you hold the scissors in such a manner um, they will be never in your way because you're still able to use your thumb and your forefinger and your scissors are pointed out of the way, um, not, not that they're going to, you know, strike anything. Um, but it is, is much more efficient to get used to holding your scissors as I have here. Uh, it's that easy to switch back and forth. And you'll be surprised at how much you can hold in addition in that hand. Um, and so uh, it's much easier than for me to be putting it down, picking it up, putting it down, picking it up as I, as I tie the fly.
So I just wanted to stop at that point and, and add that little piece of advice. All right, as you can see, the fly is almost done. We have the new thin skin wing case. And now the only thing that's left to do would be for me to brush out the thorax to create that buggy appearance. Uh, one of the features uh, that you should always be thinking about when you're tying flies is whether um, it looks realistic or not. And so, and my, I guess I cut the uh, wing case a little too close and basically uh, destroyed my wing case. Okay, so as you just saw, <clears throat> In creating the wing case, I cut the wing case off a little too short and it came unraveled and I had already cut my tying thread, but all is not lost. Um, you will probably have this happen to you uh, time, uh, from time to time. Uh, I know I do, despite the fact that I've been tying many years, um, I still have these little errors. But there's a way of fixing this. You, you might feel disgusted that you have to start all over. But I'm going to uh, choose this as a moment, uh, sort of a teaching moment, and show you what I would do to reconstruct this fly. So I am at the point where I've removed that old wing case and I still have some dubbing left, but I don't have any thread. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take off that dubbing that I had already applied. And some of this is gonna require a little bit of cutting, but. The rest of the fly is still intact. And I'm going to start my thread again onto the hook, as you did at the very beginning of tying this fly. And then I will take another piece of, of uh, thin skin material that's going to be used for the wing case, cut a point on that material. Lay it again on top of the hook of the fly and secure it down with several thread wraps. And now I've reestablished my wing case and I will take some more dubbing <clears throat> and dub the thread for the abdomen, oh, for the thorax. I keep forgetting where I am. And as I did before, once I have that thorax dubbed, push my wing case forward <clears throat> and tie it down. Several thread wraps. Lift it up, lift up the wing case. And make a few wraps in front of it. And this time, before I cut my thread, I'm going to clip off that excess wing case. And now do <clears throat> several more half it, uh, whip, whip finishes. And now I can cut my thread. So you see, the fly can always be recovered 
um, no matter what stage you're at, without having to tear it all apart, unless you really want to start all over again. And now I'm going to tease out that material as I did before to make it look buggy. And as I was saying before, um, I guess one of my mottos is the buggier the better in terms of realism, because if you were to look at a mayfly nymph uh, in its nymphal stage, uh, it's not a thing of beauty in terms of perfect symmetry. Uh, sometimes they look quite buggy. A little touch up right there. And there we have the second version of the gold ribbed hair's ear with the thin skin backing instead of the pheasant tail. Well, I hope that uh, you all enjoy tying this pattern and uh, try some several variations. If you have other fly tying materials um, uh, at your tying bench, uh, consider putting in something uh, wings such as um, this particular um, uh, piece of uh, duck quill um, or uh, another color of the uh, thin skin. Um, creativity is one of the, the greatest joys of fly tying. And so I hope that you've enjoyed what, uh, what I've covered today. And um, please, we look forward to seeing the, the product of your fly tying. It's been uh, very meaningful to us at P Potomac Valley Fly Fishers to see uh, how much artistry and creativity there is amongst our members. And uh, uh, we thoroughly enjoy doing these video series. Thank you. Mm -hmm.